Hello listeners and welcome to the Afriwetu podcast where we look to celebrate African history and culture by telling our story. As always, our hope is that it fills you with enough curiosity to go and do your own deeper research. So to all my Afriwatu, thank you so much for actually following me on the interwebs at our handle. Remember, it is at Afriwetu across all socials, so your Twitter, your Instagram, and your Facebook. Uh, thank you so much for the feedbacks. Thank you so much for the love. So I just wanted to read a few comments out for um, just to show how grateful I am, as well as to just give you all a shout out. So at David F. Hunter, who said, I love your voice. And this is a huge compliment because David F. Hunter is one of the bomb diggy music producers out there. At uh, Congolese.YouTubers, who actually took one of my posts from Instagram and posted it on their site, sharing with their followers. So thank you so much for the shout out. And their response was, thanks for highlighting the culture. Moana wa Africa who said, how I love your podcast. Not only do I get to learn our African heritage, but also the medium of delivery is so calming and relaxing. Asante sana, mungu abariki. Dada tunashukuru, asante. Everybody needs a Soila Kenya in their lives. Everybody. So at Soila underscore Kenya, follow her. Please follow her. She's just such a gem. Anyway, she said she discovered Afriwetu to this year and it's giving me life and she's constantly retweeting our stuff. Thank you so much, Soila. So to everyone who follows us on our socials and even to those of you who don't, uh, thank you so much for the feedback. Please keep them coming. Please keep engaged. Uh, if there are any particular stories which you want us to tell or you want us to do some research for you, please feel free to, to send those to us. Or if there are any interesting facts or interesting things that have happened in the history of your land, because this is a pan-African show, please let us know. Send us, you know, the, the interwebs. The interwebs are your friends. Just use them. <laughs> We are at Afriwetu on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And our email address is afriwetu at gmail.com. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We are headed back to the heartland of our continent, to this, the last of this trilogy, in the West to Central African region, the Lunda Empire. This empire is rooted in and a neighbor to our previous empire, the Luba Empire. Links to the Luba Empire and previous Afriwetu episodes can be found on this podcast platform. So for now, just sit back and enjoy the journey. So in terms of the modern location, our Luba Empire had influence over a massive landmass from modern DRC heading westwards to northeastern Angola and then south to what is northwestern Zambia. The descendants of this civilization are most notably in the form of the Lunda peoples can still be found living in these countries. So. Now that we're able to visualize the area, it's all in our minds. Let's go back to the beginning. As with many great civilizations, we have to, again, accept that the origin stories may vary somewhat regarding the actual facts. And this one is no exception. The most solid history, which is referred to by those who have studied this empire, speak of one Chibinda Ilunga. I'll spell Chibinda for you. It is T-S-H-I-B-I. N D A Ilunga I L U N G A (laughs) 
So Chibinda was a Luba prince and renowned hunter. He lived under his brother's rule, Kalala Ilunga, and decided to venture out and make his own mark on the world from under the famed Kalala. In around AD 1600, he traveled south of the kingdom and came across these peoples who lived on the fringes and were affiliated with the Luba Empire, and they called themselves the Lunda. The Lunda already had their own governance structures in place, including kingdoms. And it was here that Chibinda found his wife, Queen Kweji, who was from one of these kingdoms. She was at an age and a stage to be wed, and Chibinda obliged and got a kingdom to boot. He's said to have used the knowledge of the Luba Empire, introducing its model of governance to the region. This model was one that was adopted and seen to permeate throughout the Lunda Empire as it grew from strength to strength. So, we see how the Lunda civilization was firmly rooted in the Luba Empire. And as already mentioned, they were originally settled as a gathering of fragmented neighboring states, who then over time became more centralized to then grow into the formidable empire we now know of. It freed itself from the sphere of influence of the Luba Empire, becoming an independent player in the trade and commerce of Central Africa, reaching its peak in the 17th century AD. The capital was Musumba, which is in the Lualaba province in modern DRC. From here, the rule of the empire, the Mwant Yav, controlled the satellite provinces and states, states which could have at least 10,000 civilians. The Mwant Yav, I'll spell that for you, M W A N T Yav Y A V, were seen as benevolent rulers over this expansive empire which estimated to grow from about 150 square kilometers in the late 17th century AD to around 300 square kilometers by the 19th century. So that is a lot of territory. So if you want to think of it today, I would say think of two and a half Togos, Togo being in Western Africa, which in itself has a land mass of 56,000 square kilometers, growing to the size bigger than Burkina Faso, Burkina Faso is today 274 square kilometers at its height. The empire followed a devolved system of governance, so these states were in themselves fully functioning polities. They did share in the Lunda culture and accepted the influence of the empire both politically and economically, but were left to their own devices with minimal interference on a local level. So in terms of governance, how did this Mwantia manage to govern and rule this complex setup? Well, for starters, he had a council of advisors who were selected from the royal households who sat with him in the capital. There was also what could be loosely termed a police slash law enforcement presence to keep peace in the capital. He then had the local rulers who were spread out over the empire, governing over one million people in total this empire. These rulers then paid tribute to the Mwantiyav's representatives, the Kawata, who made sure that folk were not late with payments. And just think of it like traveling tax collectors, but they were actually chiefs within themselves. The empire was also said to have standing armies across its territory, which kept the smaller states subdued. It also controlled and monopolized trade, both the imports and exports. And where it didn't have direct control over the trade, it collected tribute from those who did carry out the trade. So essentially, it had its finger in all the wealth generating operations. And those who control the money, well, we know they also control everything else. Saying that, though, 
In the end, to be fair, life for those who were in the empire was considered to be pretty good. I mean, they got stability, and for centuries, it was a well-regulated system of politics and management of the economy. The people adopted the Lunda cultural norms and religious practices, the latter of which benefited the weakened society, as we shall see just in one minute. So, like the Luba Empire, religion was very important, especially in matters concerning societal norms. The Lunda believed in a supreme creator god called Nzambi, spelled N-Z-A-M-B-I. Zambi created the universe and everything in it, bestowing upon humans the gift of intellect. He was associated with the sky, but more importantly, he was seen as the protector of the poor. And as such, it was not acceptable to pray or take advantage of the weak in society as it would incur his wrath. Now, I would like us, before we look at the commercial aspect of the Lunda Empire, to just take a brief gander to the Kazembe Kingdom. This was one of the states that sat under the auspices of the empire and was loyal to the Mwantia. So of all the Lunda states, the Kazembe Kingdom was the largest and most significant. It emerged in AD 1740 and with many of the Lunda migrating south to this southern eastern state. The capital was based in the Luapula River Valley, just south of Lake Mweru. And at its peak in 1800, it had rapidly grown in size, covering most of what is modern-day Katanga region and northern Zimbabwe. The kings of Kazambe were named after the state, and of them, there were two notable ones. The first is Kazambe II, also called Kaninembo, who ruled from AD 1740 to 1760, and was responsible for a part of the major expansion and setting the foundation for the complex and sophisticated trade and tribute network of the kingdom. His legacy was furthered by his grandson, Kazambe IV, also known as Kibangu Keleka, from AD 1805 to 1850, who actually started trading with the Portuguese in the west and the Arabs in the east, becoming the center of trade between the two coasts. This kingdom was brought down by 1890, following internal succession wars and then attacks from outsiders. So why did I mention this kingdom? Because I just want us to sit back and think about it. That this mighty Kazembe kingdom fell under the control and influence of the Lunda Empire. So I just want you to understand how powerful this empire was. So now let's look at trade. Trade routes by the empire were established by the mid-17th century, so circa 16 AD 1650. And these routes went right up to the Atlantic Ocean. And by the end of the century, the Lunda were controlling the regional copper trade. Meanwhile, over to the east side of the continent, the empire centered its control around its outpost of Lake Mweru. The Lunda Empire, like many of the largest civilizations in that era, was involved in the slave trade, what was then a very lucrative trade. They were one of the big trading posts, and in its interactions with the Portuguese and Arabs, it accounted for thousands of slaves sold on an annual basis. The empire also traded in its own local goods, which were highly sought due to their skilled workmanship, particularly in metalwork with copper and iron, and they were also known for their pottery, weaving, and woodwork. In addition, they also traded in honey, wax, and rubber. So, the end. 
The beginning of the end of the empire was circa 1850s. It was invaded by outsiders and it was not able to withstand the onslaught. The main protagonists were the Chokwe, who on invasion settled and set up their own kingdom. They did not expel the Lunda leaders or royalty, but they did strip the leaders of their power and they never recovered from this conquest. We will be looking at all of these empires and all of these civilizations in future Afriwetu to podcasts. Don't worry. So, this empire is yet another testament to the fact that our roots have well-organized political and economic states that were in existence, people. This civilization spanned almost 300 years, three centuries. At the same time period, we can just do a comparison to see what else was going on in the world. So in the 17th century, in 1644, it was the end of the Ming dynasty following Manchu conquest of China. In the 18th century, so 18th century, there was a heck of a lot going on in the world today. So today I'll just try and mention four of them. So in 1701, the Ashanti Empire is formed under Osei Kofi Tutu I. In 1718, the infamous pirate known as Blackbeard, whose real name was Edward Teach, was killed in battle. Between 1738 and 1756, a famine devastated the Sahel and Timbuktu lost half its population. And then in 1741, Benedict XIV issued the bull Immensia Pastorum Principi. I'm sure I've pronounced that wrong. Sorry to all my Italian-speaking people. And Latin as well against the enslavement of the indigenous peoples of the Americas and other countries. In the 19th century, 1804, Haiti becomes the first black post-European republic, gaining independence from France. 1816 to 1828, the Zulu kingdom becomes the largest in Southern Africa under Shaka Zulu. And in 1865, slavery is abolished in America with the 13th Amendment. So as we come to the end, this empire also got our attention because in addition to its impressive influence back in the 17th century, we still see this influence till today. Despite it never reclaiming its glory, we still see modern day impact, especially through the Lunda people. The Lunda in DRC till today still recognize the ceremonial authority of the Lunda chief who claims to trace their roots back to the 16th century and retains the title of Mwant Yav. Furthermore, the Lunda in Zambia hold an annual festival where the war dance is performed, one that harks back to the days of the empire to celebrate a new land being conquered. This festival is known as the Mutomboko Festival. At the festival, you get exactly what you'd expect at a huge party celebration. Dancing, drums, music, and of course, speeches, and then the ceremonial tributes paid to the king. Today, it attracts large audiences, and I would say it's worth going to, if only to enjoy the experience and connect to the 17th century African empire's origins. Although we did not have time to go into it in the show, the Lunda have an important legacy one that shows appreciation of the arts and their skills with metals and wood. The wealthy chiefs would commission art that today has been unearthed from the Chokwe and the Ovimbundu artisans. We find body adornment, elaborate in its style, scepters with intricate carvings of the female form, a form that was revered by the Lunda. They were also greatly skilled in using metalwork such as copper for ornamental jewelry, as well as currency. Oh, and one last thing before we leave. Most Lunda are actually matrilineal. So in simple terms, they follow the maternal line. And this is across the class lines. So 
So, this empire is worthy of deeper research that can be covered in just this one episode. There is so much out there. So as we sign off here at Afriwetu, here's hoping I've piqued your interest. This is the last civilization in the trilogy of the West Central African region for now. And as usual, links will be added to the social media pages. So here ends our journey to the Lunda Empire. I do hope that you enjoyed today's show. Thank you for listening. And until next time, Mubarakiwe. <laughs> If you have any questions, comments, please do visit us on our social media platforms at Afriwetu on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also email us at afriwetu at gmail.com. And please feel free to also leave a message at anchor.fm forward slash Afriwetu. So I'd like to give a shout out and a huge thank you to my dream team. For one, Mwendwa Mbugwa for the direction and for all the support she's given me for Afriwetu. And then I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Big City Studios for editing, mixing, sourcing the music, the sound effects, basically all things production in relation to Afriwetu because it really does make a difference and brings these stories to life. Thank you. Bravo.